This morning's scripture reading will be taken from John 11, 24, and 25. John chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. We're awfully thankful to have the opportunity to worship God together this morning, and we're awfully thankful that you are here. I tell you, I feel blessed. I believe that this past week in our gospel meeting was some of the best gospel preaching I've ever heard from anybody. Terry Jones just did an outstanding job, and we were blessed to be a part of it. This morning, we'd like to focus on John chapter 11. If you'd start there, the first thing we'll do is try to tell the story. When I tell the story, I don't mean a fictional story. There are some people sometimes that get hung up on the idea that we ought not call Bible stories Bible stories because stories are fiction. That's just not true. Look, up, look it up in a dictionary. A story is an account of something that happens whether fictional or non-fictional. Well, this is not a fictional account. This is something that happened in the days that Jesus walked on earth. And it's an amazing account. Even though it's outside of what natural things are, that was the point. When Jesus came, he came to be outside of what natural things are to prove that he had the power to guide our lives. Jerusalem was the town where everybody went for the Passover feasts, for the Feast of Dedication, for all of the feasts that were required by the Jews. Jerusalem was the center of all Judean activity. Way up north was Samaria and farther north was Galilee. And I believe that Jesus was not in Jerusalem, but about 20 miles away at this time. At least one commentator had said that. But if you were in Jerusalem and you started walking east, you'd go over the Kidron Valley, which at that time might have been 250, 300 feet deep. And there might have been bridges across it. There might have been walkways where you know you step on a stone that's not quite completely submerged and you get across there. You would have walked across the Kidron Valley and you would have come to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where the Garden of Gethsemane was. The word Gethsemane means oil press and it was probably a place where many olive trees were. They think they know where that garden is today that Jesus prayed in so long ago. But if you went to the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives, there was a town called Bethany. And there in Bethany were some people that Jesus loved dearly. Jesus had some tensions within his own family. We learned that in John chapter 7 verse 5 where his brothers were mocking him, where his brothers were ridiculing him, and maybe even setting him up for some sort of arrest when they wanted him to go to Jerusalem to show himself because the Bible tells us his brothers didn't believe in him. Well, the Old Testament, Proverbs 18 verse 24 said that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus had some friends in this town of Bethany that were probably closer to him than his own brothers were. Those friends were Mary and her sister Martha and their brother Lazarus. Jesus got word, wherever he was, that Lazarus was sick. And when he first got word of that, John chapter 11 verse 4 has Jesus saying this, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. This sickness is not unto death. Now, if you know the story, and I'm sure that most of you do, you know that there's death involved in this story. But that wasn't the point of this story. The story was so that the Son of God could be glorified. All through the Gospel of John, the emphasis has been to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Prove that He's divine. Well, this sickness that Lazarus had was going to be for that purpose. Nobody likes to be sick, but sometimes it might serve a greater purpose. Remember in John chapter 9 where there was a blind man? He wasn't sick. He'd just been blind from birth. He just had a malady that he'd never been able to overcome. He'd never had the ability to see. And the people were asking, who sinned? This man's parents or him that he was born blind? And Jesus said, it's not that. You're way off base. Neither his parents nor he sinned, but that the works of God might be shown in him. Something bad happened to somebody, but it was going to work out for a better purpose. After Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he waited two more days where he was. He did not rush to the bedside. Finally, he said to his disciples in verse 7, let us go to Judea again. The disciples were kind of taken aback by that because last time Jesus was in Judea, you know what happened? It's at the end of chapter 10. 
They picked up stones and tried to stone him. They wanted to stone him to death. Or at least that's what happened recently. They said, they, the Jews there want to stone you. So why would you want to go to Judea again? Jesus gives an answer that seems a little cryptic, but if we understand their culture and understand the things that Jesus was teaching spiritually, you understand. He said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Well, we think they're 24 hours in a day. But the Jews had things divided up. Yeah, they had a 24-hour day, but they had two main parts of it. 6 p.m. started the next day. So if it were, we were Jewish people, then 6 o'clock tonight would be Monday. 6 p.m. started the day, and it went 12 hours through the night to 6 a.m. And then they counted from there the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and so forth. You see that in Jesus' crucifixion. He was crucified the third hour of the day. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over the whole land. Well, there were 12 hours in a day, 12 hours of daylight in which you can work, 12 hours of time in which you have things to do. They didn't have as much electricity. They had no electricity. They didn't have as much lighting at night. They didn't have as many options as we do to keep factories running, to stay up all night. Are there not 12 hours in the day? This is when you have time to do things. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now that's an interesting way to say it. Jesus tries to show with little clues that he's not just talking about your everyday physical light. He's talking about something else. They would get, well, we've got to move while it's daytime. You don't march while it's nighttime. You don't move to the next city while it's nighttime in that culture and that day. But the light that would cause a person to stumble is absent because it's not within him, Jesus says. Huh. So he goes on. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And the people thought, well, that's good. He's sleeping. He'll get well. Sometimes if you go to the hospital to visit someone, which you're just starting to be able to do again nowadays, sometimes you go, you go to the hospital to visit someone, you're glad that they're sleeping. And you don't want to bother them. They're resting. But Jesus said, no, no, that's not it. He had to say to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And then he says something that catches their attention, I would think. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why would you be glad that you weren't there when a loved one dies? Some people this past week told me that they were there when their loved one died. I've been there when loved ones died. You've probably been by loved one's size when they died. And it's sad, it's tragic, it's overwhelming. But years later, you're glad that you were there. Jesus says, I'm glad that I was not there for your sakes that you may believe. Well, what are they going to believe? He hasn't revealed it yet. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas isn't quite getting the message yet. Thomas says something that's a little bit cryptic. He says, let us also go that we may die with him. Does he mean die with Lazarus? Probably. Some have suggested he might mean die with Jesus. Maybe he thought Jesus meant let's go to Lazarus. Let's go to him. Let's go to him in the next world. Let's go to him in the Hadean realm. And Thomas says, well, I'm ready to go with him if that's the case. Or maybe just Thomas means I'll, just, I'll die with Lazarus if I need to. There's sort of a subdued mood over the disciples. A loved one of our Lord's has been sick. Our Lord didn't go. Now he dies, and he's going to Judea, where the people there want to kill him. This is adding up to no good, they probably believe. So when Jesus came, verse 17 says, he found that he'd been in the tomb already four days. That's enough for decomposition to set in, and as you'll find out later in the account, things to really start reeking to the sense of smell. They didn't do the mummification process that the Egyptians did or the modern process that we have. They just put the body in the cave. And if you were too close to the cave, even with a rock there, I suppose you might catch part of that stench. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and when the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary, remember Martha and Mary had some other encounters with Jesus. In chapter 12, Mary would wash the feet of Jesus and wipe them with her hair. And 
Remember in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, Mary is the one who's sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to the spiritual teaching while Martha's very busy and concerned about things and receives a sort of a mild rebuke for it. But now Martha is the first one to run to Jesus. She goes out to meet him where he is on the road before he gets there. She's the first one to see him. And the first thing she says almost sounds like a guilt trip. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I wonder what she meant by that. Well, there have been other miracles that were done by Jesus. Only six have been recorded thus far in this book. Jesus had turned water to wine in chapter 2. Jesus had healed a nobleman's son from afar in chapter 4. Jesus had fed 5,000, or he healed a man who was lame in chapter 5. Jesus had fed the 5,000 in chapter four, 6, walked on water in chapter 6, and then he'd healed the blind man in chapter 9. But there were many other miracles that Jesus did that weren't written in the book of John, and she may have been privy to all of those. She figured he could heal him. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But now, this is where something complimentary to her comes through. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus doesn't correct her. I think if I were Jesus, and I've, that's almost a blasphemous statement to say, but if I could put myself in the feet of Jesus for a moment, I would have said something like, you don't get it. He's going to rise this afternoon. You don't get it. I'm, this is why I've come here, to rise so that we could have glory given to the Son of God. But instead, he gives a most powerful statement, a most profound statement that has shaken the world for the last 2,000 years. Back in Exodus chapter 3, Moses had come to the burning bush and God had told him, I want you to lead my people of Israel up out of Egypt. And Moses says, who am I that I should do that? And God says, well, I'll, I'll be with you. And Moses says, well, if they go, if I go to them and they ask me your name, what should I tell them your name is? God says in Exodus 3.14, tell them, I am has sent you. We've already seen in the book of John how Jesus used that from time to time in, in, in a stunning way. In John chapter 8 verse 24, Jesus would say, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And in verse 58 he says, before Abraham was, I am. He's claiming deity. He's claiming the equality with God. But there are other times that he uses the words I am with something after it. In grammar it would be called a predicate compliment. With something after it. I am this or I am that. He already claims divinity just by saying I am. But then he tries to explain to people spiritually what he is. In John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. I'm your sustenance. I'm everything that you need. In John chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the way that you enter to be with God. And then further, I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10 and verse 11. I care for people. Here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not just I'm going to raise him and not just this is something that I do. And not just I'm going to put on a show and bring somebody out of a tomb. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. Now he starts talking about the physical and the spiritual together because Jesus would try to get people in the Gospel of John to turn from the physical considerations to the spiritual considerations all the time. He was always doing that, but it's especially evident in the Gospel of John. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable about somebody sowing seed and it hits different kinds of ground where it has different levels of success. They ask him what it means and he says, it means that somebody's sowing the Word of God and he's going to find hearts where it has different levels of success. Some people are going to hear it and reject it right offhand. Some people are going to hear it and they're going to be just as zealous as they can be until they get reeled back in by the cares of the world and then they're going to forget all about the Lord. And some people are going to have it to where they're really doing well until there's persecution and some people are going to really do well. But he's always using the physical to tie to the spiritual. Here he mixes the two about death. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, and we know that that belief encompasses everything more than just, a whole lot more. 
a life more than just saying, I believe in Jesus as the Son of God. It, that means that it changes everything about you. Faith without works is dead, we realize from all the passages in James and all the passages in the rest of the Bible. Obedience is absolutely necessary. It's involved in that belief. He who believes in me, though he die, everybody's going to die physically. But though this man die, he will live. And then he adds on, he tacks on this for good measure. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. I'm not sure I've taught that correctly in the past. I'm not sure I made an error statement, but I'm not sure it applies to this particular verse. I kind of used to think it meant that those who live at the second coming of the Lord will never die if they believe in Christ. Well, that's true, but uh, maybe what he means here is those people who already have eternal life are never going to die spiritually. There's a sense in which you have eternal life even while you're on earth. That's what John said in 1 John 5 verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So if a person is equipping himself for eternal life while here on this earth, then even though his body's going to die physically, his spirit is never going to die, never going to be separated from God. As a matter of fact, this life is preparation. If we walk with God here, we get to walk with Him in eternity. And whether we're baptized or not, if we don't walk with God here, we don't walk with Him in eternity. What I mean by that is some people might be baptized, but not walk with God. Baptism is absolutely necessary to have sins forgiven and to walk with God. But some people quit walking with God after their baptism, and that's not going to cause a person to get to heaven. It'll cause them to be lost. Well, after Jesus makes this bold statement, Martha says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the God who is to come into the world. She gets it that he's the Messiah. Then he gets a little bit closer and he comes to Mary. Mary says the same thing to him. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus then saw her crying. Verse 33. And he saw Jews who were with her crying. And he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. I like to point out to people at funerals sometimes, even if they're godless people, that Jesus understands what you're feeling at that moment. He knows what it is to lose a loved one. He knows what it is to well up inside and try to fight back tears, if he did try to fight back tears. He said, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. And then Jesus wept. We've been taught for generations that real men don't cry. But remember in John chapter 7 and 8 how Jesus was a man's man and he stood up to the Jews and he said, no, God's not your father. No, Abraham's not your father. Your father's the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. This manly man wept because he was overcome with grief, maybe. I'm not wanting to take time to get into all the reasons he may have wept there. There are all kinds of different philosophies, all kinds of thoughts. One is that he wept because he, he was just upset at grief as a human being. It shows the human side of Jesus. Even though he knows he's going to raise him again, he's upset at the prospect of death. Death causes that to people. Even if it's not your loved one and you hear about death, send some sort of wave of sadness in you. Other people think that maybe he cried because he's going to have to bring Lazarus back from the dead. Because here Lazarus, if he'd have been a faithful disciple, would have been in the bosom of Abraham, would have been in comfort. And then you've got to bring him back to this world to be tempted again and go through all that. And maybe he's crying because of that and I don't know the exact reason the Bible doesn't reveal it to us my contention has always been that it might be all these reasons balled into one because the times that I cry there's never just one reason it's a whole bunch of things that come together but I could be wrong about that too he wept he understood people's pain people said see how he loved him some of them said, well, why, why didn't he heal him then? Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? So Jesus made his way to the tomb, said, take away the stone. Martha said, by this time there's a stench. He's been in there four days. Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see this glory of God. This is for the glory of the Son of God. 
And then he prayed, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying this for the people who are standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. See, he's going to get his glory now. Six miracles are recorded in this book, and this is the seventh. This is the culminating one. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Jesus had done many miracles and that was the culmination. This statement that Jesus makes in verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me and dies, he will live again. He who lives and believes in me will never die. This is just one of the most profound statements that there are, that are in all Scripture. And that's saying something because there are a lot of profound statements in Scripture. The more I think about this, the more I could probably add to this. But let me just give you a few things this statement affirms and a few things it denies. First of all, it affirms that Jesus has authority over life. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching a sermon because they've healed a lame man. People are there and, and people are wondering what's going on. People, Peter starts preaching to them and he says, You asked for a murderer to be granted to you. He's talking about how they demanded Christ's crucifixion. And when Pilate was trying to assuage the, the, the angst of the crowds and give them some sort of death, but he knew Jesus was innocent, his wife had had a dream about, about him and didn't want him to have anything to do with Jesus, he's trying to let Jesus go. He says, how about letting me give to you Barabbas? Barabbas was a robber, a murderer, murderer a treasonous man, the Gospels say. And people said, give us Barabbas, crucify Christ. So Peter's accusing them in Acts chapter 3. You asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life. The word prince there is archegos in the Greek. I've told you about it before. It means the arch. It means the prime. It can mean the author. It's translated the captain of our salvation. It's the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 2.10 and 12.2. In other words, Jesus owns life. He's the creator of life. Life would have not have come into existence without him. He's the agent of creation. God's the Father's the source, and all things were created through him and for him. Remember John 1 said? And that's why I find it so fitting that in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, when Peter is preaching about Jesus, it says that God loosed the pains of death. Christ was dead. But God loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. It was not possible to keep Christ dead. It was just outside the realm of possibility to keep him dead. Why? Because he is life. We've had criminals that are called the merchants of death. We have people that think they're powerful because they can kill people. No, any misguided, brazen, hard-hearted, evil soul can kill people. But only one can give life to start with. And then he also has the power to re-give life. If people don't want to believe in spiritual things, if people don't want to believe in supernatural things, I can't make them. But I can show them reason. Your choices are to believe that everything came about by chance or your choice is to believe that there's a supernatural being out there smarter than us who designed everything with all this design. And if that second one is the case, then there's a supernatural being out there smart enough and powerful enough to make all this that we see in design and completion. Then he's powerful enough to intervene once in a while to make his will known. And he's powerful enough to raise the dead. I am the resurrection and the life. This verse affirms that Jesus has authority over life. He claimed it in John chapter 5 several times, spiritually and physically. And Jesus then affirms in this statement in John chapter 11 that his mission is to give life. Back in John chapter 6 verses 39 to 40, in the context of the discussion after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus says, This is the will of the Father that sent me, that of all he has given me, I will lose nothing, but will raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that he who sees the Son and believes in Him, shall have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. There will be a last day resurrection, and these people can have everlasting life. 
It was Jesus' mission to come and give life. I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. He said in John 12, verse 47, He did not come to destroy people. He came to save people. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. His mission here was not self-serving. His mission here was to submit to death so that he could show he had the power over it eventually. His movement didn't get started like other military religious movements got started. Muhammad started his movement with a few followers and eventually it became a military movement where he forced people to condemn, forced people to condemn their former religions and follow him. And then later Muhammad died. Jesus' did, church didn't start till 50 days after he died. 50 days after he was resurrected, I should say. The first thing that Jesus did was went to the cross and died. And at that time, none of his disciples, he had zero disciples. But then for the next 43 days, three days later he raised and 40 days after that, people started seeing him. People that would go to their deaths claiming, I saw the resurrected Son of God. And then Peter preached him on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 of them, who seven weeks earlier had called for his crucifixion, are baptized into Christ that day. They believe. Jesus' mission was to give life. Real quickly, here are a lot of points. Jesus' statement in John chapter 11 denies... Now I've got a bunch of doctrines that are listed here and they're big fancy words for common things that you might hear about every day or maybe not every day but once in a while. So don't be afraid of the big words. It's just a preacher's way of organizing things I suppose. I'm surprised I even know a big word but every once in a while I do. This passage denies the doctrine of materialism. You can use that word in two ways. One way is that you love stuff and you love money. That's not the way I'm using it. The way I'm using it is the atheistic materialism that says there's no such thing as spirit. There's only things that we can see. Only things that we can see are real. Well, not even the scientist believes that because on the molecular level there are all kinds of things that they posit that they don't actually see, but they can tell that they're there by the effects of the things around those things they're positing, which is exactly what God said in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that the invisible things of him are clearly seen by the things that are made, being evidence, evidence of him being unseen and yet being the, there. This passage, I am the resurrection of the life, tells us about duality. It tells us there is body and there is spirit. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James chapter 2 verse 26. 1 Kings 17, a widow's son passed away. Elijah stretched himself out on the child and prayed, Lord, let this child's soul come back to him. There is body and there is soul. And there is promise then that when we put off this earthly house, this tent, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, we'll have a building from God, a house not made with hands that is spiritual, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he's affirming dualism, not materialism. There is body, there is spirit, there are unseen entities that still exist. And it's interesting that Colossians 1 verse 16 in God's word is careful to claim that. For by him all things are created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Watch this next phrase. Visible and invisible. There are invisible things that were created. Like souls. This statement in John chapter 11, 25 and 26 denies determinism. Determinism is closely connected with materialism. It says that since all there is is material things, then you're not really making choices. You probably don't hear this doctrine as much. But it's there, and it's the logical outcome of materialism when people say, well, all that you have is your body, all the carbon in your body that's billions of years old, they say. I saw that recently this week. And you're just dust, and you're just the accidental firing of synapses in your brain is what gives you your choice that you think is your choice. But no, it's all just there. It's all predetermined according to how the things are going to evolve in your brain. Now, this, this passage denies that. It gives people choice. He who believes in me. There is such a thing as spirit and that spirit makes a choice. 
closely related to that, but really on the other end of the spectrum, that's atheistic, materialistic determinism. But on the other end is sort of a religious determinism, Calvinism, that says, well, God chose some people to be saved. God chose some people to be lost. You can't do anything about it. You just got to wait for the Holy Spirit to tell you what it was. And if you don't hear from the Holy Spirit, then you must be lost. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no choice. I don't know how much John Calvin originally taught that, but he taught some things that led to it, and it's become that that doctrine right there, the doctrine is the problem, not the name, confuses a lot of people. But once again, he who believes in me, that's a choice that the person makes. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter said, God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Those are choices. Fears him and works righteousness. Whoever fears, and according to Calvinism, you could fear God, work righteousness, and still be lost because you weren't one of the predestined saved. But Peter said, that's wrong. And Paul said in Romans 2.11, there's no partiality with God. This statement, I am the resurrection and the life, denies racism. Racism is an evil that has encapsulated societies for years and keeps rearing its ugly head to cause more damage and strife. Gospel preachers have been preaching against, if they've been faithful gospel preachers, they've been preaching against it before the civil rights movement, before the current critical race theory debates. Racism is evil and racism is flawed. Any human being can make the choice to have life. Doesn't matter what nation. There used to be some white preachers who wouldn't preach to black audiences. That's going to cost them their souls. That's racism. This passage denies racism. This passage denies, this is the biggest one, species egalitarianism. This is simply saying that animals are equal to men. That we ought to treat everything just as equal. Your dog is just as sentient as you are. And so you ought to treat that dog just like you treat yourself. And those cows, you shouldn't eat those cows because they're just equal. You, would, you wouldn't eat a human, would you? So you wouldn't eat a cow. But that's unbiblical. It's denied by Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. After they got off of the ark, God reiterated that he made man in his image. And God said, you can eat any of these animals you want. But whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he was created. Men are different than animals. And this passage implies that men are different than animals. You can't find an animal that will believe in Jesus. You can't find an animal that will confess Jesus Christ. You can't find an animal that will die and then live again. They have instincts. They act like they have feelings. Some dogs like you, other dogs bite you. But they don't have spirits and they don't have souls. This passage implies that. And this passage speaks against nihilism. Nihilism is the doctrine that comes out of materialism, that comes out of determinism, that nothing means anything. Or Solomon said it, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the Lord. What profit has a man from all the work which he does under the sun? Everything's vanity, Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and 3. And Solomon goes through all the things. I tried women, that didn't satisfy me. I tried wine, that didn't satisfy me. I tried money, that didn't satisfy me. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. But if Solomon hadn't got to that point, all he had was nihilism. Nihilism simply says everything is worth nothing. You'll live your life, you'll die. It didn't mean anything. It didn't mean anything to anybody else. It didn't mean anything in the world. It didn't mean anything to the people around you. It was just completely useless. It's a vain, depressive philosophy. This passage says that's not true. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. It was worth something. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. It was worth something. And it may be that in two or three generations people forget who Andy Robinson was. I don't care as long as my name is in the book of life. Then my life mattered. And this passage denies paganism. This passage denies animism. 
Animism goes farther than species egalitarianism. Animism says that this pulpit has a soul and that tree outside has a soul and everything that you eat as a plant has a soul. Everything has a soul. It's what you see in the movie Pocahontas. It's what some of the American Native Indians believed. No. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's referring to the human species who are able to make choices. And then this passage denies narcissism. There are people who are diagnosed with narcissistic disorders, and those are on the extreme ends of the spectrum, I suppose. They're maybe psychopaths, the people that commit crimes and domestic violence and abusive situations because they're, everything's all about themselves. But in my opinion, this can be sort of on a spectrum, and some of us might have a tendency to give a little bit more glory to ourselves than we're supposed to give. This passage tells me <laughs> nothing in this world is about me. Nothing in this world is about me. It's all about Jesus. And why would Jesus say so many times, he who desires to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will save it. I think sometimes maybe that the narcissism creeps in. Well, I know what the elder said, but I don't have to do that. Well, I know this verse in the Bible says that is required for salvation, but my mom didn't believe that, and my grandfather didn't believe that, so I'm not going to do it. It's not about you. Not about what you feel, not about what you think. It's not about me. What I fear, what I think. Everything is about Jesus. Now, I know I've used this illustration before, but I'll tell you again. As one speaker put it, you're not in a movie starring you. You're just an extra in a movie that's all about the Lord. If you want to look at life that way. That's humbling. But it's liberating. The truth shall make you free. You don't have to worry about your status anymore. You can just live a nice lowly status and then go to heaven. That's the goal according to 1 Thessalonians 4. Let everybody just work with their hands. Let everybody treat their neighbor right. And this is just die and go to heaven. You don't have to worry about all these other things about lifting yourself up. As a matter of fact, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18 says. And as a matter of fact, Jesus, the one who had the right to be served by everybody else, two chapters later in the upper room after the Passover will get down on his knees and wash the feet of all those disciples who followed him and even the one who would betray him. And he'll say in other places, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come and start a religion because he felt like that was the thing to do. The Father sent him. He references that so often in the book of John. Maybe we'll study that sometimes. The Father sent him. I've not come of my own but the Father sent me. Jesus says, it's not even about me, except that the Father glorified me. How dare I think it's about me when I have all these commands to which I should submit and just let God take care of the rest. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. We have these cautions from this Bible story. Beware of your reaction to pain. A lot of people will accuse Jesus, accuse God of not being there or be angry at God when pain happens. But remember, pain served a great purpose in this story. Everybody hated losing Lazarus. They cried at losing Lazarus. Jesus cried at losing Lazarus. But this sickness was not unto death but for the glory of God. Martha cried. Mary cried, we think. This doesn't say that specifically. For Martha... We believe everybody had this pain, but it worked out to prove that Jesus is who he said he was. And it worked out to prove that he has the power to give people eternal life. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. James 1, 2, and 3. Not only that, we also glory in tribulation, because tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Beware of the reaction to pain and beware of misleading philosophies. There are all these different philosophies that people embrace to one degree or another. Remember what Paul said in Colossians 2 verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you. 
regarding the philosophies of men with empty deceit and philosophy according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Ground all of your thinking in Christ. Why? What's he got to do with life? He is life. And he's life after life. He's the only one that matters. Overcome the pain of life. Overcome the end of life. And you can only do that through Christ. Here's how. As we heard proclaimed for us so well this week. You believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Do you believe this? He asked Martha. I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? If you believe it, then be willing to confess it before men. And if you're willing to confess it before people and live that way, you confess the Son of God and then be willing to repent of your sins. Give up what you want to do and do what Christ wants you to do. And then of absolute essentiality, be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then of absolute essentiality, know that that is not the end. You're not done. You're just getting going and you could fall away so easily. Like the seed that went on the soil that had rocks underneath it and couldn't take root. Sprung up but couldn't take root. Or like the seed that was sown on the soil and the weeds choked it out, representing the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Know that you got to keep going after baptism. And become more and more faithful and more and more growing all the days of your life. And know that the Lord is there to help you with it. You're not on your own. It's not an arbitrary test where he's trying to see, see if they can make it. See if you can do it. Oh, you got to be better than that. No. He wants to help. Will you let him? If you need to repent of unfaithfulness or if you need to be baptized into Christ, we'd love to help you this morning. Would you please come forward as we stand and sing? Oh, your sin.